वेलकम टू आई एस एल अनेबल्ड वर्चुअल लैब ऑफ सी एस आई आर एंड नाउ इट्स टाइम टू आस्क साइंटिस्ट So now we have Dr. Kartikeyan Vasudevan who is a wildlife biologist from CCMB Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. He studies animals both in forest and in the zoo. He learns about endangered animals and helps save them. So Jigesa, why don't we go ahead and ask our question? So Dr. Vasudevan we in the first segment of this episode we learned that squirrels bury nuts and that sort of brings us to asking uh, how do animals learn these things or so who teaches all these animals to do these things Yeah that's always a very uh, intriguing question for a person who observes them so if we relate these behaviors to survival how they can keep the body condition intact and uh, reproduce and raise their offsprings that's a huge pressure for any wild animal so yeah that's where i would uh, describe these behaviors explain these behaviors to start with so the environment that they live in sort of determines what kinds of behaviors they might have yes it's the environment and also the conditions that are there like there are both abiotic and biotic factors the abiotic factors what do you call as temperature humidity precipitation then there are biotic factors that is resource availability every animal requires resources either plants or animals to feed upon and uh, then another biotic constraint is predators and the third thing is finding mates so all these things come into the picture and play a role in deciding what behaviors will be performed So as you already pointed out there are so so much of variability that can happen in their environment but yet they have some behaviors which are constant no matter what right so how do they get such behavior so for example squirrels burying nuts they do it no matter what then why do certain animals have such specific behaviors yeah see there are uh, some uh, which are called innate uh, or instinctive behaviors uh, we also have such instinctive behaviors for example the infant of a human child having the ability to clutch anything now if the newborn child doesn't grip to the mother doesn't hold the mother and cling on to the mother for warmth and for nutrition it is most likely to die see the innate behaviors are like uh, windows that open and close during the development of the organism so for example if a chick a bird actually doesn't beg for food it doesn't get food now it will beg food at a certain stage in its life it will not beg food after a few weeks because it will start to forage so that begging behavior will be opened as soon as it hatches that moment it comes out of the egg it will beg for food so this happens at a certain time window and it stops when we imagine scientists studying animal behavior we imagine a laboratory where the animal is kept like in a sort of a cage and you study its behavior but we can also imagine that this might not be their natural behavior because they are taken out from their natural setting so we are curious to know how do you study animal behavior in your setting in your lab yeah so wild animals uh, show behaviors which are surely native to their conditions but when they are moved into captivity some behaviors change there are some cardinal rules of making observations that you do not become a factor in modifying the behavior so you have to habituate the animal you almost become like a tree in the landscape and uh, like a branch of some plant and just be there and uh, just observe and not speak uh, not do anything that disturbs the animal and with time the animals begin to trust you they develop a trust that this person who comes with the same you know with a binocular and a notepad and just does some scribbling in the notebook is not going to harm me and they just go about doing their own stuff so yeah easily a behavioral study will take uh, about 300 such full days of observation after the habituation period because you've studied animals in the wild as well and you study animals in captivity also have you ever observed peculiar differences between their behavior from the wild compared to when they are in captivity yeah very much see many things change when they are in captivity 
first uh, thing to change is uh, confinement in space. The space is just reduced dramatically because there are walls all around. Second thing, there's no predators. It's very safe. Third thing is that the food changes completely. Okay, in the wild, there's so much stimulation, sensory stimulation, noises, sounds, smells, things unpredictable. You know, it rains, it, then it uh, it's dry, and then you have to search for water. So the lack of sensory or the sensory deprivation that they undergo and the restriction of space that is made to happen when they are brought into the zoo forces them to perform abnormal behaviors. And uh, these are redirected behaviors, like in the case of primates. They groom each other. And for them, grooming is like us sending a WhatsApp message. or It's a connect for the primates, right? They're checking out, you know, what's happening to you, you know, are you okay? And all those things. So uh, when they're doing the grooming, if that is deprived, they start doing things hurtful to themselves, like pulling out hair from their own body, aggressively grooming themselves yeah, and uh, performing behaviors which are totally unnatural. We get a wild animal and have it in captivity for many years. And like the animal is being bred in captivity for many years. Is it possible that at certain stage, they don't have those behaviors enough that they can go back to the wild? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Now, if we have to do that, as I told you previously, those abnormal behaviors might be reduced in the captive brown generation. But we should ensure that the sensory stimulus to natural behavior still continue to persist. Now, they should be interested in foraging, for example, right? So that is a, a very important factor we have to take into consideration. When we are even thinking of breed, pro, breeding them, increasing their numbers, what is the purpose? What are we trying to achieve? If the goal is to finally reintroduce them, these factors need to be brought in at that stage itself. So on that note, I would want to ask you if there's a younger generation who also enjoys watching animals, learning their behavior, and may want to at some point pursue such a career like yours. What's that advice that you would give to our listeners in that perspective? For students, don't uh, feel guilty of gazing. If you're a gazer, watch through the window when the class is going on. It's not wrong. It's very important. And uh, you should uh, be able to justify it based on what you have listened just now, that it's important to watch even a sparrow or a crow or you know a bee or uh, a butterfly just through the window. And uh, just be curious enough to follow it uh, periodically. And there's not, nothing that makes it wasteful to make that observation. There's nothing wasteful about it, both for oneself and for every other reason that might help you in the future. So I think uh, we should just be unashamed and say, I love to watch and just observe and uh, just be curious. So Utsuka, what did we learn today? Squirrels are born with the ability to bury the nut. This kind of behavior is called innate behavior. Just like you and me, squirrels are curious and just like you and me, they also try to be prepared for the harsh climate. Some squirrel species have excellent memory and complex hiding methods that help them win over their competitors. And Dr. Karthikin explained to us how they compare observations of animal behaviors in the wild and captivity. He advises that we shouldn't shy away from gazing out of the window once in a while. But listeners, what we know about animals' innate behaviors might change as we get more evidence over time. Who knows, one of our listeners might study wild animals in the future and find out something about them that we never knew before. So, that's it for today. If you want to know more about today's scientist, check out their profile. The link is in the show notes. If you have any questions you want us to explore, shoot them away to indiaaskswhy at gmail.com. If you would like to talk to us directly, then join the fun on our Telegram group. Again, the link is in the show notes. For updates on India Asks Why, follow us at India Asks Why on Twitter 
and at India underscore asks why on Instagram. Shweta N. Hegde and Ruchi Manglunia are the hosts for the podcast. Induleka MS edited this episode. And Khushi Goyal transcribed it. And we are funded by India Biosciences Second Outreach Grant. Until next time. Till then, stay tuned and stay curious.